right, let's go. One, two, three, and start. Get the questions going. All right, guys, how you doing? Welcome back to the episode of the Fire Ride Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest, former UFC veteran and tough 12 or tough season five veteran, Robert Emerson in the house, guys. Yay! <laughs> guys, how's it going? Robert, right up. You, you see my older child brother. Um, yeah. Oh, please. Introduce yourself to people who possibly who don't know uh, who you are, sir. Um, so yeah, I've been in uh, MMA probably for like I think twenty years now. I started back with Mark Ruas. Remember back in Orange County? Yes. Back in. Yeah. I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about that. Yeah, a long time ago, man. It's crazy. Um, yeah, it's nuts. It's cool just to see how big the sport has grown. We were all into it back then as kids, just because it was, it was, it was. We were just loved it. It was literally out of passion. Like, fuck, how cool is this? And it's just cool to see martial arts like grow into the platform that it is now, and see the support and everything it has from the fan. Like it's it's wild. It's cool. And it just keeps growing and getting bigger too. But it's cool to know, keep in touch with the grassroots guys. You know, like when this sport made that transition from like Valley Tudo right, to what it's called. Right before it was called MMA, mixed martial arts, it was called Valley Tudo. Right. And it's oh, very- oh. Well, uh, NHB, right? Remember that NHB? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. NHB Noel's Barn. The Valley Tudo means anything goes. Yeah. You know, and this sport originally came from the headbutts, soccer stomps, all that stuff. And then now all the fans know this sport is MMA, but it's cool that, you know, there's a lot of guys that are, uh, they've been around for a long time that, especially from our area, you know, there was such a big movement for MMA in Southern California, you know, back then. Yes, sir. Robert, you know, I'm the, I don't think you know this, but I was there. I possibly one of the first fights, amateurs, I think possibly cage combat back in San Pedro, back in 2000. Yeah. I was, I, was a kid, I was in high school. Yeah, like 19 you years old. I, mean, I was so impressed with your performance. You were just a kid. Wow. You were jacked. And like, dude, you fought an adult. Like, dude, I remember a big guy. Yeah. You just chopping him up with low kicks. And like, I think you knocked him in the first round. Like, you, you get, boom. It was pancreas. So, open palm, yeah. no fist, you know. And like, you put the guy's nose in the first round. It was amazing. Yeah. It's crazy. I got a, I got a scar on my hand. I don't know if you can see it, but I hit the bridge of the nose this way, and bro, it looks like a little hook. You can kind of see, see it a little bit, but right there, it. and uh, that was crazy. Um, yeah, it was different rules. It was pancreas, you know. Um, but we did a lot of that training with Mark Ruas already because, uh, because of like the uh, Boss Root and all them, Frank Shamrock, they all competed in you know, you know, King of the Ring and all that. It was all like, you know, pancreas style fighting and uh, shoot box style. So it was cool. Um, uh, it was uh, it, it, now in hindsight, learning and yeah, learning about uh, as an adult now, like it's um, it's uh, I think MMA and these MMA gyms, they're they're like modern day, like mystery schools almost. You know what I mean? The human being gets a chance to go in there and in a cage with another another human is trying to hurt them. And. It's like a fight or flight simulation. You know what I mean? Yeah. Fight or flight. And um, something happens to the human being on a genetic level, as well as a conscious level, when we choose fight over flight. Yeah. And um, it's crazy. This is what all these secret societies, um, the, the Freemasons, all these, all of them, all, they've, there's tons of them. They've been around for a long time. But these schools are based off of conquering fear. You know, because something happens when uh, our species conquers fear and um, uh, it can only be done in very, you know, a, a very few arenas. So to experience something like that at a young age, 19, I remember you fighting as well. I think you were 18 when you had a fight. Yeah, right there. I did. I, Why do you remember that? Oh, right? crap. Yeah, yeah, crazy, man. I, I know. I remember okay. that. It was crazy. It was that was like, yeah, 20 years ago now. And um, oh, wow. Oh, man. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's cool just to see. uh you know, us unlocking these potentials at a young age, you know, and now it's cool to see the sport growing and, and kids getting into it and, you know, young, young adults and everything. So it's cool to see it grow. Well, who, 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 who got you into kids combat on, on, that, on that day, back in 2000? Uh, damn. So that very first one, I, I went there just to watch. I went there to go watch Bow fight, right? Oh, Bow right. Watch was a- Dude, guess what? Bow, my friend, I went there to watch my friend fight and I came late. He fought Bow. Like, 
Oh man, it, I I didn't see it, but I when I got there. I was beating the piss out of my buddy, and then I just bowed yeah. and just started training. And like the guy was able to get a heel hook, and like everybody, 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 I tapped out with a heel hook, you know. But ah uh, shit. Dang. But yeah, wild bow bow. That was dope. Bow. Man. That was dope. Yeah, that was just like a tough kid at my high school. I heard he was just some like older tough kid that trained and like he would like he would like meet up with like drug drug dealers and shit and like poke them out and choke them out and take this shit. But I fought this kid tough and there was word around going, hey, that bow guy's gonna fight in a cage fight. And we're like, what the fuck? A cage fight? Like and it was in a sketchy area. It was like in it was like in the in the docks of like San Pedro. Oh, you know, it's bad, it's bad. Yeah, it was a trip, dude. Almost like a movie setting. It was like an abandoned boxing warehouse. Yes, like, yes, yeah. It was straight right? da- dangerous. Ghetto. So I was just there watch. I was just there watching Bow's fight. So I had, a, I remember I had a pack of donuts in one hand and a fucking Corona on the other hand from like the liquor store across the street. Like that's what that was my breakfast: donuts and beer. And we were watching these fights. Things like a Saturday, and I had a black eye from like getting in a fight the night before. Damn, um, you crazy. Yeah, yeah, just one of my buddies and we uh the 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 guy the promoter was like, Hey, he's like, How much do you weigh? I'm like, I don't know, I'm like a buck fifty. He's like, Fuck, you look like a fighter. He's like, one of the guys dropped out, uh, similar to your weight. He's like, You would you mind stepping into fighting? I was just like, Fuck. I I, I mean I really had like I think I kind of trained a little bit um with Chris Brennan at the time, maybe the time. a little bit. Yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe. I think uh, maybe or maybe not. Maybe I think but almost, I think almost no training. I think I started training after this okay, okay. because I was going to go, the, I was going to go to the Navy, dude. I actually uh, had a family friend that was in the Navy and he pulled some strings for me that I, I was, I was going to be allowed to go in and try out for the SEALs right away. Oh, So I was, I was training for that. I was obsessed with that. And um, yeah, I ended up fighting in the, in the tournament that day or the, the, the fights that day. And um, fuck, I remember like my friends are like, fuck, just go in there and fight. They're just don't get choked out in the first 10 seconds. I remember thinking, fuck it, all right, I got nothing to lose, let's go. And I remember the guy almost choked me, got me down. I forgot what kind of choke it was. It was like a high elbow guillotine, but I remember always going, I remember the fucking lights going out like this, and I remember turning over and, like, seeing my friends all cheering. I had my hand, I'm like, fuck, I'm like, don't fucking go out like this, Robert. Like, get the fuck up. I remember (laughs) I'm just going to explode out of it. I did, like, an alligator roll and explode out of it as hard as I could and stood back up, and then I fucking... And we broke, separated, they came back in. I threw that overhand right. I yeah. think I, I, I KO'd him. Yeah. And it was cool. It was cool. The rush of everyone jumping over the fence. I mean, some of the guys were jumping over the cage, like landed on the, landed on the poor guy, and they ran over. And, <laughs> yeah. Chris Brennan was there. Chris Brennan jumped in the cage. He was all psyched for me and everything. And uh, was yeah, I was just after Michael, cool. was after Michael Huas? I, I thought you said, I thought. Um, I no, saying, no. Like, this was like, this was like right before. Cause, cause, um, because because Chris also trained with Marco at the time as well. Oh, okay, okay. And this was back when Chris was the king of the cage uh, lightweight champion. And um, so Marco had his school in the Good and the Gel, and then Chris Brennan had the Next Generation Academy in Mission Viejo. Um, and they're, I mean, they're a few miles apart, maybe seven, uh, yeah, six, seven miles apart, something like that. Um, but uh, I remember I was training with uh, Marco um, I don't know. First, it was at first. I think it was at Chris's gym. Yeah, I just went there for a couple of weeks because like Armbar, Nick Lario, and all those guys trained there. So I went there to kind of dabble and check it out. And then, um, and then, I, and then I heard Marco was opening up a gym and actually Laguna Niguel where I lived. Um, so when I started training at Marco's gym, uh, Chris came there to to train. Was getting ready for one of his fights. Marco was training him for, and uh, Marco used me as a sparring partner for Chris. Mm. And uh, I remember that, dude. I remember that. Fuck, I was a young kid. I think I was yeah, 19 or something. No, or years I, older. Robert, as a fight, I was, I was, I was so impressed with you performing. I asked, hey, man, where are you training at? You know, Margaret, who, or you told me uh, just 20 years ago. You said, Margaret, who, uh, oh, dude, the legend. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it was. It was. Yeah, it, w- it was exactly how I remember it. I remember we put on gloves where I was going to spar with Chris, and I'm like, Okay, fuck. And I was kind of, I was kind of nervous. He was a big, he was a king of the cage champ. I think he was like 29 years old at the time. He had like 10 years on me. I was still a young kid, just just a tough kid. Got the got in a lot of fights in the streets and did martial arts, you know, since I was nine. Um, I had like I had like a brown belt kill cushion, you know, which is like a really oh, that's hard, that's hard, man. Japanese hardcore that's, that's style. Not, dude. That's not nice. 
was not no nice. for it was, sure. But it was like it's hard to me. It's like, only close to Muay Thai, you know. Very yeah, it's all bare knuckle, body shots, a lot of body shots, head kicks, a lot of good kicks. G has his black belt in Kyokushin. Who, who does? Uh, George George Saint Pierre. Oh, does he? Oh, damn. Yeah. George is yeah. dope. Yeah, and a lot, a lot of, a lot of K one fighters and Glory fighters. Um, and he, and he, but I remember right? during that. Yeah, yeah, I remember during that sparring match with Chris. Um, I remember I decked him. I threw an overhand right and cracked him. Boom! And he, he fell, bot, he fell off and fell off the mats. Now Marco used to have these like, these like, um, this mat was like elevated like a foot above. He had tires, right? He had rubber tires, and then. And then a, a wood plank over the tires and then mats on top. So you could like slam guys and everything. And it was pretty like, you know, mm. pr pr pretty good, pretty fun training map. But I, I remember I hit Chris Boom and I knocked him <laughs> off it and he fell off and he I fell back. And, I, did, um, I did laugh. It was a good story. Yeah, no, it's crazy. It's a trip. <laughs> it's, um, and um, I remember I had like, I had really bad fucking like bubble guts. Dude. I don't know what I ate. Something must have been some kind of fucking coffee or energy drink, but Bro, I had like shit in my pants so bad. I remember after I knocked him off the mat, I like felt my stomach rumble. So I literally like put my hands down, I'm like, oh fuck, I gotta go to the bathroom. And as I did that, bro, he like came up to me like he was in a fucking uppercut, me, dude, like a what? cheap shot. Yeah, dude. Yeah. And I was like, what the fuck? I remember I said, what the fuck, dude? I'm like, bro, you fucking, you, you bitch, pretty much that you fucking, you know what I mean? I, and and, uh, and we kind of got into it. He said, what fucking, and we kind of got into like a little fucking yelling match. And I'm Marcus, like, okay, okay, take off the gloves, take off the gloves. Or, okay, he's like, hey, now you guys are going to grapple. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, Marco, I'm like, dude, okay, yeah, you should fucking tag that guy sparring, but fucking dude, we're grappling. He's like a black belt, fucking king oh. of the cage champ. And I'm like, no, this is where it's dope. He's dope. He's dope. Dude, of course, I didn't know shit. I don't know oh. nothing about grappling. And this is what I respect about Marco Huas more so than anything. He was, he was a psychologist. Before he was a before he was a fighter, oh, I mean, be, 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 coach, uh, the 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 power of belief that that man instilled in me was is, it was incredible. It, it's incredible. It's uh, it was the most empowering thing anyone's ever done for me. And right there, he said, "Throw off the gloves. You guys are gonna grapple. Do this." And I'm like, "Dude, I was kind of scared, nervous." He pulled me aside. He's like, "No, Robert, look at me. He's look what you just did to that man." He's like, "Dude, you can beat this guy. You can beat this guy." He's like, "Believe in yourself, Robert. Believe in yourself." I said, what? I'm like, fuck. He's like, come on. You got, I'm like, okay, fuck. I remember he ended up grappling and doing the match. I'm like, fuck, maybe I can beat this guy. I'm like, I just, I just won't get submitted. Just defend, defend, defend. Yeah, We're grappling. He, he goes to get me in a heel hook or some shit oh, like that. Damn. And then he had his foot exposed. So I got him in the heel hook as well. And I remember we, we both had ourselves in heel hooks like this. And he was fucking not letting go. And I wasn't letting go. And he's like, you're going to fucking tap. You want me to fuck? I'm going to fuck you. I'll, you tap. I'll fucking rip yours too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. yeah, oh, yeah. No. I remember we kicked and we separated and he's like, what? He's like, fuck, we can go fucking outside and fight right now. You know, and Marco's like, Mar Marco was pissed. Marco actually threw Chris out of the gym after that. Hey. Yeah. Marco threw Chris out. And then um, shortly after that, um, it was the first ever uh, MMA fight. In, in California, it was in Orange County, and Tito Ortiz, like Tiki Ghost, and all those guys. I think they threw it, and it was called it was called Hitman, and and they did it. They did it in Orange County at the uh, oh, fuck some was club it, in Orange what was County. That club? Was, was it no, 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 no. This is before then. What wasn't even oh, the OC? No. Um, it was off some old comedy club or some kind of uh, place that used uh. Fuck, what was it called? It had the beach? Uh, no, it was more Costa Mesa. More Costa uh, Mesa, Newport Beach. But the show was called Hitman, bro. Uh, Baba Lou fought Chael Sonnen on that card. Yeah, yeah. I remember that show. Oh, god damn. Yeah, I remember that show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. Oh, Orange oh, Channel. Jim Terrell fought on there, too, right, I think. Jim Terrell, yeah, there's oh, a lot, damn, Yeah, I remember that now, yeah. Old yeah, school. crazy. Um, so I ended up fighting Chris Brennan on that show. Oh, damn. I, it, yeah, yeah, we did a catch weight at 165. So, and then uh, this is one of the I, questions that asked though, so you 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 train, you train, you already trained with Chris at the time? So, yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe like maybe like maybe like two months. No, nothing oh, more than like two months. It was, very short. Uh, it was, it was no, 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 no. Very short. Very short. Mm -hmm. And then and then we had that incident at Marco's gym. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. and after that, Chris left, and then I stayed training with Marco, and then um, 
Yeah, first, first they they were gonna try to put me on the hitman card. I guess first I was gonna fight Fabio on Iha, but he oh, said no. Up, yeah. and, uh, I was told that some other guys said said no as well. Some other the local guys. I won't call. I won't. I won't call any names. But I, ah. I, was, I was. Yeah, but um, uh, but then, uh, but then, then they asked me to fight Chris. I said, "Fuck yeah, I love to fight Chris. Let's do it. It would be a fucking grudge match." And it was cool. They did a catch rate at one sixty five. Oh, and <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was crazy. I remember I fucking walked in the arena that day, like fucking huge. I remember I was like 183. I was like 183 oh. when I got I left. Yeah, I was big, dude. I felt so <laughs> fucking strong. Bro, he uh, he fucking threw the towel in. Wow, I remember. I was, yeah, I remember. I fucking defended all of his shots. I was defending his takedown, defending his takedown, just kept, just picking at him, picking at him. And um, the end of the sec- the big end- the first round ended. Um, and then uh, he didn't come out for the second round. They they threw the towel in. So, and, and, and there's a yeah. fight, I heard this, this is like to me, Logan Orange County is legendary. But in my head, I thought you, you were under uh next generation. I, I thought there was a some type of a miscommunication or beef. Yeah, it's like a kung fu movie, you know, like the master, <laughs> and the, the master stood by each other. And like, dude, this is crazy. And like, you, you beat him, like, Chris, you know, he's he, he beat no the Orange County, he's a big deal. He's famous, yeah. you know. Man, the word of like wow, Bobby Everson. I know, I know you. I know you. You're, you're dope. But Chris Brown like he's legendary. Like damn, black belt for sure. This time, not that many black belts. You know, it's scary. But dude, you won. Yeah. You, you yeah. Upset. That's, dude, I'm so happy. I'm yeah. so crazy. Yeah, I think I think it's one of my favorite fights, dude. Just like just because it was a grudge match and just to get the ending like that. And then, um, bro, I later, later, like Jeremy Williams, because Jeremy Williams was in his corner, and you know, God rest his soul and everything, uh, was in his corner for that fight. And um, we were all friends, you know, Southern Orange County, especially Southern, uh, yeah, Southern Orange County was a, it was a pretty small MMA community. You know, we all knew each other. We all grew up and went to the similar high schools and parties and shit like that. And maybe all got some brawls together growing up. And, and, uh, but, but, uh, I remember Jeremy told me that Chris went up to him at the end of that first round and said, throw the towel in. I don't want to go back out there and get knocked out in front of everybody. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, And Jeremy was like, no, no, no. He's like, dude, go out there. He's like, tell me, he's like, dude, just go out there. You have to finish. You can't go down there out out like this. Like you've got to go back out there. He's like, no, throw the towel in. I'm not going out. He's like, I'm not going to go out there and get knocked out like a fucking coward, dude. So it was two, it was two, uh, it was one round. One round, one round, then wow. he threw the towel in. Yeah. yeah. And I remember I lost all, I remember I lost respect for him. Even Jeremy told me he like, he lost respect for him after that. He's like, dude, that was kind of bummed. That was heart, kind of heart disheartening, you know, to see his kind of, his idol and protege, like, uh, whatever. That's coward. That's coward shit. That's coward mentality. That's fear. You know, yeah. you got to fucking go. It's like, like this podcast is called, I mean, fight or die. Fire die, fire die, man. You know, fire die, fire die. You know what I mean? hey. This is, if, if you are lose anyway, just just go you go for it. Just, at least you look good. You know, you look good. You know? Exactly. I, dude, I think no if fear. You're, if you just got knocked out, it'd be better. It, it looks better. Yeah. You know, I mean, in my humble opinion, you know, I want Chris Brandon to receive it, and I say, you know, in my humble opinion, my humble opinion, you got to get knocked out. It would be better. You know. For sure, wherever, you know he went in there. For sure, yeah, but, but dope. I, man, I want, I want a story. Um, yeah, crazy. I, real quick, how it. did you? How would you do to Marco Huas? Real quick, how how, uh, how did you discover so, him? How would you how did you started with the legend? So this is this was before when I was just doing traditional martial arts. Actually, um, yeah, this is after after I did uh, Kyokushin, I started doing Kaji Kembo, which is another um, um. Hawaiian style of uh of Kempo, uh Taekwondo and um karate. It's like mixed. So I've done a, a a long time from the time I was nine to about 16 doing just all traditional martial arts, Kaji Kembo and Kyokushin. And um my my instructors, my sifus, my senseis, they all said, Hey man, you you hit super hard. Like I would all spar with the adult the adults and I would all give them bloody noses and black eyes just as a kid. And so they always said, yeah, it's crazy. They said, oh, man, you hit really hard. Like, man, when you, when you turn 18, um, you got to go to this guy. And they gave me, I remember they gave me his business card. 
And they said, Marco Huas. I'm like, oh. I'm like, dude, he's like, he, and they told me about using the UFC. He was like the first UFC champ. I'm like, what? I'm like, what the heck is a UFC? They're all, bro, I'll come back here. So after, after training, they went in the back and they played for me my first ever UFC disc. I remember watching it and they showed me the guys fighting bare knuckle. And bro, I was like, I was, dude, I was super young, dude. I mean, I think 11, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. Like, I was like, what the heck, dude? This is like, at the time, I was like, this is some Mortal Kombat shit. Seriously. Mortal Kombat was, you know? It, 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 was. it, was, it was. It was nuts. For sure. But Mortal Kombat wasn't even out yet. But I was just like, <laughs> no, it was not. <laughs> you know? And then, um, so I'm like, wow. And then, and then and sure enough, um, I guess Marco came from Brazil, just happened to be right there in Laguna Niguel where I live. But I guess the first school that he opened up uh, got shut down. Because too many people were getting hurt. Too many guys were getting broken noses, broken jaw. Because he was having them spar full throttle and go like pan pancreas sparring. And uh, he even I did mean, one. Pan, but that pun, but that palm is serious, man. Yeah, for real. So that's a, I, I, would, I would love to do some uh, combat grappling matches even even now. Oh, yeah. you know I mean? Hey, like, bravo, that'd yeah. Fuck, that'd be awesome. But uh, he had to go back to Brazil because that first school got closed down because it was too violent and the city got too many complaints. So, mm. um. Uh, about a, a year or two later, um, I got recommended him again by another instructor or Sifu or sensei. He said, man, you got to go visit this Mark Ruas guy. He's here in town. I'm like, wow, okay, this has to be like fate. You guys are talking about him. Like, I have to go. I remember just happened to be a couple miles from my mom's place. And I went down there and, um, bro, it was crazy. It was, uh, I remember him sitting me and my mom down and just telling me, he's like, dude, this, this kid, this kid, this kid can be a world champion. If this is because my mom was kind of concerned and worried at first, so he kind of talked to her to make her feel at peace, uh, at ease with it all. And kind of like, no, this kid has serious potential to be a champion. And it was crazy. I remember just like hearing the man talk, it's almost like it put you in a trance, and it just like gave me complete confidence, dude. Complete confidence. Um, crazy, kind of hard to put into words, but even for my very first uh pro MMA fight. Was against Jen's Pulver, Jen's little evil Pulver. I was, I was gonna bring that up, like people. Yeah, I was gonna say that. I'll, I'll be, I'll be that again. 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 Which is, and just for him to give me the the confidence to take that fight, and like going into that fight, I had like a major injury. I separated my AC joint, so my arm was actually in a sling up until five days before the fight. So I couldn't hit pads. I couldn't lift weights. I couldn't spar. The only thing I could do was kick and do plyometrics and like run. You know what I mean? I couldn't even like do any motion with my left arm, which was huge. You know, I could practice my right side and my right kick. And um, so it was crazy. It was, it was a dangerous situation for me to go in as a 19 year old. I think I was 20. Um, um, you know what I mean? And uh, just crazy. But the confidence that Marco gave me going into situations like that, um, it's fascinating. Now in life, uh, I'm on the head striking coach over at the MMA lab in, in, in Glendale, Arizona with Benjamin Henderson and uh, uh, Jared Kennedy and all these guys, you know, Sean O'Malley. So we got a lot of talent there. And I, I get a look at this sport from a psychological side now. And so I've been, I've been obsessed the last five to seven years or so studying psychology and alchemy and hermetics and, and all these mental arts. And um, it's profound about how much conquering fear is is the meat of all this stuff it's crazy crazy shit if you go back to uh the nile river now in egypt along cairo there's there's 12 different temples built along the nile and uh these temples were part of something called the the left eye mystery school of horus and there's 12 years 12 years of the male side and then 12 years of the female side so all together, there's 24 years of this school. They call it a mystery school. Now, why would someone dedicate 24 years of their life to something? It must be pretty profound what they got at the end of that. You know what I mean? Uh, well, that's, we can get into that if you want. Uh, but what they got out of the 24 years when they completed it was the title of becoming an initiate and an adept. And after that, they were allowed to access the Great Pyramid because of what the pyramid was used for. Um, but these, these temples that were built, they were designed to conquer fear. The, the, the students would study all year 
And at the end of that year, they would take the test in that particular temple for that year. And there was 12 of them. So right, 12 years. And in that temple, they had to do crazy things like things that are uh, almost uh, in like Indiana Jones, like crazy things. I can tell you about them if you want. We got time. But uh, I, initially, it was about the conquering fear. You know what I mean? And what takes place within the human being when we conquer fear. And so I'm very, very grateful to Marco um, for instilling me with that confidence at, at a young age. How old were you at this time? Around this time, how old were you when you actually finally got to train with the, the legend, Larry Marco Ross? I was 19 years old when I first trained with him. Yeah, I was nineteen. All right, next question. Now, we, um, how 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 did you and how old were you when you finally started training with Chris Brennan? Were you ever part of Next Generation, Mr. Robert? Um, no, I never, I never, I never competed for it. Like it, it was just like a trial training. Like I, some of my friends went there and I went to go check it out. Actually, before his gym, there was something called Extreme University. It was called Extreme U. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was by the Mission Viejo Mall. It was across from Saddleback the Community College there in the hometown Dana Point that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. and, um, it was called Extreme U. And it was, um, it, was, uh, it was the McCauley brothers. It was Sean McCauley. Oh, McCauley, yeah, Justin the dog. The oldest LA boxing. John Lober, yeah, John Lober was there. Yeah, legend, 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 legend. Yeah, that, that was the first uh, fight gym uh, ever in, in, in Southern California. Yeah, yep. boxing, uh, boxing, yep. First one. Yeah. And then, and then from there, uh, and went over to, uh, from, from, to, to next generation, Chris opened his, his gym. Mm -hmm. So it was just like a trial. I just tried training at Chris's a couple months, the next generation guys. And, um, and then I, when I went with Marco, it was a lot closer to my house. And I remember he wasn't like, um, I remember he wasn't charging me as much so as a kid. It was kind of hard to pay for training. Same and, same um, same. it was just, uh, I just felt, I just felt a connection, dude. I felt an energy and it was a, it was something more authentic about the way he spoke and the, about the way he, uh, he treated the, 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 the arts. And, um, I don't know. So yeah, I kind of gravitated towards Marco, you know, it's, 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 and actually I think I'm the first American to get a black belt from him, Oh, which is pretty, yeah. That's, the first, a, big, that's a big deal. Right? Uh, um, yeah. Is this is a uh, professor? Um, is he a loot delivery guy, or is that, is that, or is that how that is too? Loot delivery? Yeah, yeah. So Marco, who else? Yeah, he was like he was like he was like the king of like loot delivery in Brazil back when like Gracies were coming up with like jiu jitsu. The, the, the there was, there was a, yeah, it was a huge rival between loot delivery and jiu jitsu. So the Gracies represented the jiu jitsu side, which everyone knows about the Gracies, but people don't know too much about the other side of that story. But the, 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 the loot delivery, yeah. yeah. There was legit brawls, just like just like in the kung fu movies. Bruce Lee was like legit brawls, gnarly brawls in these. In the, in the they're almost like gang fights. As, no, I do like, know, it is. It's bad. It's, it's bad. Yeah. Crazy. Dude, Michael Hua and Hicks and Gracie. There was a rivalry between them. Those, those, those they never fought, but in my humble opinion, I think if they fought, I think Michael Hua takes it. For sure, bro. Marco uh, was a very intelligent combat uh, fighter, not just like a jujitsu guy. But he was super smart, just the way he picked apart the human body and the way it moved and how he always said, your hands are your first line of defense. He's like, he's like, yeah, most fights go to the ground. And so we're obviously going to train on the ground, but 100% of fights start on the feet. Okay. And so he was always about first line was boxing. First, we learned boxing the hands. He, and then, he's a pro boxer, right, Robert? Pro boxer. Yeah, yeah, boxer, yeah. And then also a Muay Thai champion and Luta Libre. I mean, just he covered it all and then after the hands the next weapon of choice was a leg kick was mm -hmm. to take out that lead leg because it was a safe kick you could throw and to get out of the way from the head from the hands and just the way he broke it down like it resonated a lot with me i think even just like two or three years ago uh jose aldo just got his black belt from from marco as well oh yeah yeah, yeah oh. from a pedro hizo yeah i was just oh. down there bill i was down there uh with bj penn when he fought uh Clay Guida for his last fight because I was I was part of his camp me and uh, Diego Sanchez and I went down there to Brazil and I met I met up my teammates and stuff with uh with the lab guys and Jared Cannonier Jared actually fought Anderson Silva that night oh, and broke oh. yeah it busted his knee and um um but I remember I I, I went and I went down there I saw Pedro and all these guys and there was it was kind of weird it was kind of a weird interesting vibe 
but uh, yeah, there was a guy, Emerson Falcao, who's a uh, very, very, very humble, good. I think he was one of the best Muay Thai fighters in Brazil. Oh, That's wow. what everyone is. Um, so uh, he was down there. He, he's uh, Jose Aldo's uh, Muay Thai coach. And oh, so God. it was cool. Well, well when you came with Mahua, was uh, Peter Hizzo there too? Came with you there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bro, wow. I, I've took it. I've taken many kicks from Pedro and Babalu and all these guys. How, how big is how big is that guy? They were weird. They were weird. They were wear two shin guards on each leg. God because damn. they kick because they kick so hard. There's so two shin guards, but they wouldn't hold, they wouldn't pull their kicks. They would fucking kick me. I'd flip upside down. I remember so many times, at least like once a week, I would drive a home with a concussion. God damn. Yeah. So they're heavy, heavyweight. Remember, Bro, yeah. legit heavyweights, dude. Yeah. I was fucking. You're a kid. I mean, lightweight. Those are like two plus. Yeah, for sure. Buck fifty, dude. Buck fifty. You know, but still, it made me fucking just iron mind. You know, I've been I've been in a lot of street fights too. I've been in hundreds of street fights, and God I, damn. I, I can't <laughs> I can't recall ever fighting losing one. Maybe maybe like two as a kid. You know, as a youngster, you know, not not even double digits. But um, man, I think that mindset. That mindset I learned from Marco, just like to be invincible, to be fearless, almost like that Wolverine mindset. Oh, for sure, you know what I mean? Sure. Like invincible, heals himself of anything, fucking eats cigarettes. Just like that mindset, even as a kid and watching X-Men and Wolverine, like Wolverine's mindset captivated me. You know what I mean? Sure, and sure. now that I'm learning all these, all these alchemical and hermetic sciences and neuroscience, I'm finding out that how much truth there's actually a lot more fact than fiction when it comes to this kind of thinking and this kind of mindset, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Man, Bobby has some stories. That's some good stories. Uh, How were you introduced to uh, Chris Brennan uh, a, long, a long time ago? Is he, is he ever like a uh, friend? Yeah, friend of friends. Um, you never hung out before, you and Chris? Um, yeah, we, I think we, we, we've, we've been to a couple of King of the Cage fights and stuff like that. For, I think for, for those couple months that I was, that I was, uh, training with them, we were pretty close. Like I went to a few fights with them and, you know, hung out and, and uh, it was cool. I was like part of the squad. And, but then I, I, I remember when I had a, I had an instant connection with Marco. I remember it was kind of weird leaving Chris and Jim, but um, when that incident happened, when we sparred, that was it. After that, after that, mm-hmm. I already, yeah. So, and even, even after the fight, after, after I beat him, he threw that towel in, I heard there was rumors of him going around telling people that I, uh, oh yeah. I, Cause I, I came up to big bear. I went up to big bear to go train at, um, um, who was it? De La Hoya had a house up there in big bear and like Tito Ortiz and Chris and these guys would go train up there at this house. And I went up there, um, uh, to go just to go to go train yeah. with uh, like Gerald Strenbent. You remember him? Yeah, Gerald he's do- he, next, gen, next gen, right? It was yeah, yeah, Gerald, yeah, yeah him and uh, yeah, my buddy, I think the time. Josh Thompson, right? Gerald? Yeah, the yeah, 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 crazy. And um, yeah, he uh, I remember we, I went up to just the train. I remember we ran that fucking Big Bear Hill and it was summertime. And it was, it was I, still to this day, it was the physically most hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I remember getting on the top of that, 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 uh, that slope, that, um, that lift there at Big, at Big Bear. And I remember you can taste the iron in your blood. I mean, you can take, you can taste the blood in your spit. You can taste, it was crazy. You know, Big Bear is rough. Big Bear is rough. Yeah. You know, but he, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't, I remember I didn't train with Chris at all. I mean, he had his own coaches, his own guys. I didn't train with him at all, but he was going around telling people that like we grappled and he kept like tapping me out all over the place. And I'm like, I mean, if we grappled, you probably would have tapped me out, but bro, we didn't train. We didn't grapple. So like, why am I fucking getting told from multiple people that he's telling people that we fucking trained and he like balled me up and choked me out and fucking like ragdolled me around. Like fucking bitch. No, you didn't. You fucking do the- <laughs> you know what I mean, you know what I mean? I just, I don't know. That's yeah. Don't fucking throw the towel in like a coward and then go talk shit on me behind my back when you fucking bring me up there like you're a friend. You know what I mean? Like fuck you, dude. You know what I mean? So I got a bad taste in my mouth of that guy. And then I heard just a bunch of shady, sketchy stuff he's done about some shit before he moved out to Texas and all this stuff. So whatever, dude. Uh, I don't know. I don't got no 
hard feelings or animosity now. I wish him well and yes, the black working out for him and everything, you know. But yeah, it's crazy. I haven't even remembered half these stories, bro. Until you're asking these questions, it's kind of a trip. I mean, I didn't even on time, you know. I I'm a big fan of yours, man. You know, since since the underground days, man. I mean, boxing, man, striking is very good. Oh, uh, the next question, you know, I think uh, someone has become very famous. Uh, a uh, good friend, of Ian McCall, so creepy. Yeah. And from what, from, from, I used to train, I used to train with him at right? Apex Jiu Jitsu with Jimmy yeah. Williams. You know, uh, for I want to say that Ian McCall, Brian McCall, they have always been very respectful to me. Always been very nice. Yeah. Those are super cool. You and Ian were good friends as well, right? But and, like, w- at one point, there was a difference between you two. Uh, was that right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was. I mean, it's been a long time now. Um, we're, we're, we're totally fine now. It's just, uh, I think we're just young and, um, just dumb young kids. And there was a lot of, a lot of different variables that came into play with, with all that. And, uh, we lost one of our very good friends and teammates, oh. you know, Shane Del Rosario and all that stuff. And it was, uh, mm. it was, a, uh, it was definitely like, uh, tro- uh, people say life has like, you know, the, the trials and tribulations, and I think that was like a trial and tribulation time in my life, at least for finding out um, who I was and first time ever dealing with death with someone super close to me. And I didn't really know how to manage that and deal with that. And um, I kind of, uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy. That was actually a hard year for me after that happened. And I remember I got released from Bellator right after that happened. Oh, and I was yeah. uh, just, it, or not, not, yeah, not released. I got suspended. I got suspended for like 18 months. What, what and, happened, um, sir? Well, why did he suspend um, you? Um, I think I tested positive for like provincial or something. It was right when Bellator got bought out by, by Viacom. So they had new ownership. Hmm. And so the very first fight under new ownership, they tested everybody on the card. And I had like a prescription just from like a psychologist for like OCD, you know, cause I'm, I'm literally diagnosed with OCD and Tourette's and all that stuff. It's, it's, and um, I never, yeah, that's another crazy story. I cured myself of that stuff. Like as a freshman, crazy, crazy story. Congrats, um, congrats, so, congrats, congrats. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't think anything of it. Like I, I normally never even took the medication. And I remember taking it the day thinking, oh, maybe it'll help me focus a little bit. And up until that point, I thought that the athletic commission just tested for steroids, cocaine and weed. Um, I never knew anything about testing for like uh, any kind of mental medication. So I remember taking the, the, the prescription of it that day or whatever, or the night before the fight. And, um, and then sure enough, when I tested, um, I came up positive with three other guys in the card. The other three guys in the card all tested positive for uh, steroids and weed. And, and um, I'm like, fine, okay, so so suspend them. But you know, my shit, it's like, a, I have a fucking prescription for it from a psychologist. Like, And I actually ended up getting it overturned. I went I went, went to the commission. Yeah, I went to that, uh, that uh, commission up in LA and got it overturned and everything. But still, it was like, I was still suspended for freaking 18 months. Like, you know what I mean? And um, fighting was the only thing I knew. It was the only thing I knew, and uh, that kind of sent me to kind of a depression. I really didn't go to the gym. I was training at Kings MMA at the time, you know, and um, I remember I went to the gym maybe like seven times that year. I, just kind of, I was just being a, being a dirtbag and drinking and partying and feeling sorry for myself, and uh, the whole thing with Shane and, and Ian and all them happened, and uh, um, there's actually a big reason, yeah, why I just came out here, too, was to come to Arizona and just start new and get a fresh and get away from all that and kind of uh, – I figured, oh, this is the last leg of my career. Let me go somewhere and start a new one or a new team, a new, uh, you know, environment and just see what I can do with myself. And it's the best thing I ever did for myself was getting out of Orange County and coming out here to Arizona. Um, I like truly found myself and uh, yeah, found myself and like my, my life path is completely clear now. So it's, it's been a blessing. Man, man, I'm very happy for you, Robert. Um, next question, you yeah. know, a lot of people don't know this, but you know, you fought the former UC champion Jens Palmer. That's like in, in your second fight. I remember reading about this. I didn't see that fight, you know, back then we didn't have YouTube yet. But um, I remember reading a fight and it said like, man, you're winning, you win that fight, you're, you're lighting them on the and like you're dominating. But I, I guess um, he won, he won the decision. I think is that is that right? Um, yeah, I love. Please tell me how that came yeah, out. Cool. I, came up with that, I, I want to hear your side of the story. I have a shirt on. I was like, as I was reading it, you know. Yeah, that 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 whole thing. Dude, crazy I saw, too. you were winning. I was so excited for you. Yeah, it was cool. It was uh, 
it was actually really cool how that all happened. And here's like a cool little like law of attraction story. Right. So, um, um, yeah, I had those, I had those four, I had three of those pancreas fights with the open hand fighting. And then I had one closed fist in the fight because actually on my third pancreas fight and, and cage combat, the same place there in San Pedro, uh, um, uh, was it Ken Shamrock's dad was there like kind of scouting because mm-hmm. they had the lines then down to San Diego. Right, right, that's right. I saw, I saw, yeah, I see, I see it's, uh, Vernon Taylor White there too. Yeah, I Vernon that, White, yeah, Billigman, yeah, Vernon White, Ken Shamrock, a bunch of bunch of big names from back in the day were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Tiki even trained down there at one. Or I'm not Tiki. Um, um, I was to do all the tattoos on his back. Freaking, I forgot his name now. Crazy. What's he what's he's what's had, he's like? had the big cross. Oh, remember he had the cross, he carried that big heavy cross out Kimo, to the cage. Kimo, 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 Kimo. Man, yeah, yeah, crazy, Kimo. And um, so, Kimo, so I got we'll, invited. We'll, yeah. Kimo, yeah, Kimo, I was in the interview with him. He told me to meet him at a cemetery and he freaking didn't show up. What the heck, dude? Yeah, he bailed on <laughs> me. Um, I just got a real quick <laughs> story about that. I did this, yeah, back to your story. Continue, continue, continue. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's crazy. Yeah. That doesn't does surprise me. That that guy was wild. Hey. That guy continue, was wild. Continue, 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 continue. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, um, what was it so? Oh yeah, so so my third fight over there, I won, and and then uh, Ken Shamrock's dad approached me and said, "Hey, would you like to fight in our fight we got going on down the lines?" Then Ken Shamrock said, "Down in San Diego." I remember thinking, "Oh, cool, fuck yeah, I got invited for my next one." This one was a closed fisted fight. I think it was three minute rounds. So same style as like the amateur MMA fights now. Um, uh, we, had, we had shin guards on. I saw the video of it actually somewhere. Oh, but we got oh. shin guards on and little MMA gloves. Uh, we go down there. We go down there. I go down there with Marco. Bro, I remember that day. I remember I weighed in on the scale at 149. Oh. I, I go in there. I get on 149. My opponent weighed in at 183. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. He's, you took the one, fight. 181 or 183. Yeah, of course oh, it took it. Man, this is heavy, man. There was no weight classes. Back then, oh, there was bro. no weight classes. This, this is the beginning. Like, right in the beginning. You know? And, um, bro, it was cool. I won a unanimous decision. I beat him all three rounds. I remember I busted oh, his nose. Cool. Got him. Oh, my God. You're crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it was cool. Oh, man, I would have uh, out, man. You're the man. That was cool. It was, fun. It, was another, it was one of those confidence things, though. Marco was there, and he just made me believe in myself. He'll just attack his leg, kick his leg. Whenever he sits down the punch, just kick his leg. Bam, bam, bam. It was fucking so sweet. It was, like, one of the coolest feelings ever. And um, I remember uh, Terry Treblecock from King of the Cage was there and some other local promoters. Oh, Terry, Terry, Terry. Wow, yeah, we like, we like, to, we like, we like to sign you. Um, unfortunately, at that time, I was, yeah, I was 19 at the time. And then um, I got, unfortunately at that time, I got into some trouble getting into some street fights and shit with some friends of mine. And I got in a lot of street fights and shit, but uh, a bunch of bullshit went down. I'm having to serve nine months in like the, the local, uh, the local Orange County uh, jail or whatever. And um, so I, I did that. I remember I had my 20th birthday in there. I turned 20. Um, but right before I went in is when, uh, is when Jen's, Little Evil Pulver fought BJ Penn for the first ever lightweight world champion title fight. Yeah, that you know, he then beat BJ, but as an upset, you know, because yeah. at this time BJ was a monster, 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 and it was the first time they ever did a lightweight fight. Before that, it was only welterweight, uh, middleweight, light heavyweight, heavyweight, super heavyweight. Those are the that's top right, five. That's right, that's right, that's right. I remember this. These guys fighting was the first introduction of the new lightweight division. Boom. And I remember mm-hmm. watching it at my friend Wyrick's house and we were watching them fight and, and we were all rooting for BJ to win. Well, fuck, let's go, BJ. And um, and then um, he even had that arm bar at the end of the first round, right? That's right. He, yeah, I, he almost submitted him. That's right. Yeah, and then and then um yeah, and then uh, the bell ring or whatever. Yeah, the bell ring. Then, yeah. And I, I remember watching I, I, that. I think I think they were tapped. It was like it was like, eh. Yeah, I think I think I think that it was uh, nowadays. I think they would have stopped the fight and really gave it to BJ, you know. Yeah. But Jen still went down the history books as the first ever lightweight world champion, you know. Yeah, 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 first, I remember thinking, "Wow, I want to be like these guys." I mean, awesome. Now, 
the UFC has a lightweight division. Now I can aspire to be a UFC fighter. I'm like fucking awesome. So shortly after that fight is when I had to do uh how to do my nine month uh, sentence or whatever. But while I was in there, I was ordering all the my fight magazines, mm. you know, like, uh, was it um, full contact fighter? Oh, it's the, the newspaper. The news Yeah, the full full contact fighter had like the, the uh, I remember I, I subscribed to that for years. I love the newspaper. I, the, the news, I love yeah. I had that. I had that. Yeah, I had the newspaper. It was kind of cool. And then uh, I got like a bunch of a grappling magazine, all the local. I, I taught him they had a bunch of them. And I would order all of them. And um, because the UFC just happened, Jen's pulver was on the cover of a lot of them. Yeah. And I mean I, I remember even I still have it saved. I still have the same, I still have the sports illustrated here. Um, it was the first time the UFC ever had an ad in the Sports Illustrated, and it was with, it was with all the UFC champions and Carmen Electra, and she was oh. standing with her belt, and Jans was there, Pulver, uh, uh, Pedro Hizzo, Randy Couture. Um, it was like the whole lineup of the champions, and it was cool. I remember I was just a nerd fan, you know, um, but I remember taking all the pictures of Jans and even the posters and even that picture and that and that uh, Sports Illustrated, and then. Uh, putting it all over my bunk and shit and my while well, I was in there and the, and uh in the jail or whatever and um I remember I would just wake up the first thing I would see would be Jen's every time I woke up because it'd be right here on the bottom of my bunkie's bed like this and now the last thing I saw before I went to bed the first thing I saw when I woke up was just a picture picture of Jen's pulver and so oh. I put it in my fuck I want to be like this guy I want to do this I want to do that and I was all kind of training in there and it's crazy to talk about the law of attraction, but I get out, I get out of my, my nine month se uh, sentence on Christmas Eve. Nice. Yep. And, uh, it's crazy. I remember, I, uh, three weeks after I get out, I'm like training and everything went back there with Marco. And, um, one of the guys in the gym comes up to me and asks me, he's like, Hey, how would you feel about fighting Jen's little evil pulver? Oh, um, yeah. And I, I said, I know what's scaring me. Boom. And I was just like, what? And right, right away, no hesitation. I'm just like, I'm like, fuck, let's do it. I'm like, if this you're is something. Man. That oh my get. God. You're the awesome. man. I'm out chicken chickened out, man. Nah, we have, we have to have no fear. We have, can't have any fear in this life. And I remember thinking then, I'm like, if this is something I want to do, then let's see how good I am against the very best. And we'll Go. see what's up. We'll see. You know what I mean? Yeah, so awesome. And the guy's like, what? Oh, he's there. I'll do it. I freaking, we knew you'd say yes. I was like, yeah, let's do it. I'm like, how is this happening? Am I going to fight him in the UFC? They're like, no, no, no. Because back then, the guys he was the best. He's the man. He's the best. Oh, he's a man. He knocked. He knocked. He's a man. Yeah, he's a man. Yeah, it was crazy. So uh, they told me, yeah, it's going to be in Minnesota and some other show outside the UFC. And um, he's still there. No, no, and no, no. then um, I'm like, yeah. So so I started training for that and shortly in the camp is when I busted my EC joint, boom. And uh, I had my arm in a sling. So I remember I only had like four or five weeks to get ready for this, for this fight. And I've never fought pro before. I've never gone five rounds, let alone against fucking the UFC's lightweight world champion, the best in the world. The best, the best, the best. Man. So, uh, and he was also Southpaw, which was oh. another. Uh, Annoying. You know? Yeah. It's really hard, hard to deal with Southpaws, especially I never had the experience fighting Southpaws yet. So yeah. I was still, Guys. We just, just, just kids, you know? Yeah, we were, man. Crazy. Um, but again, that that overcoming that, I remember being in the same warm up room as him. We had the same warm up room. So I'm literally looking across what? the room, you know, 15 feet away from this guy warming up to kick my ass. And in what? his corner, he had, he had Matt Hughes, Robbie Lawler. You know what I mean? Killers, oh, dude. Yeah. Killers, dude. And here That's I am, just a, a 20, run, 20 year old kid. My first fucking pro fight, you know. I've had four amateur fights. I've only been training maybe a year, you know. Not an official, not an official amateur is underground. There's no, there's yeah. no amateur is underground. Yeah. For sure. And who is in your so, corner, Robert? At this, at this, at this, at this uh, moment. Just Marco, Marco, just Marco. Just, just one guy. Yeah, just Marco. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, that's all I needed, bro. He, he was like a one man army, dude. The confidence he gave me was just like. It was it. It's all I needed, dude. And and if you watch, bro, it's so funny. He never said anything during the fight. If you watch any foot footage of him, he's just completely quiet watching the fight. He doesn't yell out anything. <laughs> yeah, I got 
country, dude. He doesn't say shit. It's crazy. <laughs> Man, I, I, there's, there's no video of that fight, right? Because I, I always wanted to see that fight. There's no video of that fight, right? You were dense. Yeah, I used to have a video of it, man. I don't know. It might be on a VHS somewhere. I think I sent a bunch of guys VHSs to get switched into DVDs. I'd have to go through moving boxes. I, I have I have some pictures of that fight. I know on my Instagram, uh, uh, Ascended Athletics, I, I posted some pictures of me throwing some shots and trying to meeting him and stuff. So yeah, you you were just I mean, yeah, right? you were, uh, I was reading you were winning that fight, you were, you were beating him. And how how yeah. busy how busy for you, Robert? Is he small? How how big? He was big, yeah. I was really? small wow. for that. I couldn't lift weights because my arm, my arm, my arm was in a literal sling. Imagine trying to train for a fight nowadays and with your arm in a fucking sling. Mm -hmm. I couldn't move it at all because this wouldn't heal. No one would. No one would do that. No one would take that fight. I wouldn't. You know what I mean? Fuck! I I I didn't want to let that opportunity slip through my fingers. You know what I mean? You're the man. You're the man. So I, yeah, very cool. Very uh. I discovered a lot about myself then during that, uh, during that experience. And it's crazy for, and all this stuff I'm learning about now, I, I, I even relish and, um, appreciate that now more than ever. It's very, very cool. Robert, did you uh, wrestle in high school or jujitsu? Robert was like, I watch you uh, fight, you're grappling you're on point, you know, you don't, you don't skip a beat. Yeah. Um, no, I just I just did Luta Libre grappling with Marco. What? And then I would yeah, I, I would I would go to Dana Hills High School and wrestle with their with their with their squad. Um, they, they, just they as go. like extra just for like conditioning and wall defense. I would have them shoot on me, you know, under like Reza Abedi. This is actually Reza's shirt, like assault it says Abedi train. Oh. On the back. It's, 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 yeah. It's there. yeah, he was the coach there and um just a tough, badass little Iranian guy. He had six single legs, great single leg defense. Like you couldn't take this guy down. So I would just, I would just train and rep all these uh, takedown defenses, you know, while I train. And it was cool. It was, um, and it was so fun, so fun. It was, it's so, it's so mind blowing to see how big the sport is now. It, it's freaking crazy, dude. Like Nate Diaz just fought out here in my hometown, freaking last weekend. Really? And, um, and they yeah, 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 yeah. They, they, they just fought as a coming event against Leon Edwards, and um, oh, it was right, it's right, it's right. Yeah, the UFC. So it's crazy. It was crazy to see, like, just how big it is. Like how I was in the Ultimate Fighter with him, and how how big that show is, how big he is, and his name is now, and uh, the growth of where the sports come to where it's at now. It's fucking crazy. It's mind blowing. It's crazy. I was gonna, I was gonna ask you about the Ultimate Fighter. How was your process in getting the Ultimate Fighter, uh, Robert? Right? Uh, yeah, um, introduce you to, 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 to the producers. So, what was your process getting into it? So, for me, um, I know normally they had like a 500 man tryout or something like that. And from there, they take people. And uh, right. for me, uh, I was actually driving home from training one time and I, I was, and the, um, the, Remember Charles from Matt from yeah, Mass yeah, from yeah, Tap Charles, Out? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, God rest his soul. Yeah, it was uh, beast. It was beast. Yeah, for sure. Um, man, what a what a movement that guy was doing with the tap out and just blowing up MMA in, in, in this in the Southern California area and just such a significant role in in this sport. Current fans have no idea. Mm -hmm. Um, but but he called me. I remember driving driving back from training, he called me. He's like, Robbie, Rob, what up? How's it going? Like, he always had the best personality, so outgoing, just like such a people person, like crazy, very positive, crazy, very positive guy, very positive. crazy energy with this guy. And um, he's like, hey, he's like, hey, hey, I got someone that I got someone that wants wants to talk to you on the phone. I talked to him. He's he's like, hey, bro, this is the. And you can tell he kind of went in the other room. He's like, hey, this is the producer of the Ultimate Fighter. I'm like, um, I'm a. Uh, I've been telling her all about you. She so she's actually heard a lot about you from a bunch of other recommendations, a bunch of other promoters from the uh, Southern California area. And he's like, dude, he's like, dude, it's in the bag for you. All you gotta do is kill it, dude. He's like, here she is. I'm gonna put you on her now. She's saying that she's not, she's gonna have you just come out and skip the tryouts and just fly out straight from the medicals. So I remember getting on the phone with her and I was kind of making her laugh, kind of just like joking around and, um, just making her laugh me and and uh, she and uh, she's like man I, I love your energy she's like it's crazy we were already actually looking at you uh, to have you come out uh, because we had your name submitted to us from a couple different promoters in california 
But at now after talking to you, she, she's, she's like, I for sure want you to come out. She's like, so this is what we're going to do. We're just going to fly you straight out to the medicals in Vegas. And as long as you pass the medicals, it's good. You're in, you're on the show. And um, so it was cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was cool. It was perfect. No trouts or nothing. And then um, she kept in touch with me and she told me, she's okay. Like, hey, and she told me before I went out there, she's like, so there's a lot of other uh, people that are involved in this process including the, the guy that runs uh, Spike TV, because that's where Ultimate Fighter was aired on at the time, Spike TV. And she said, hey, these guys are kind of hard asses. She's all, this, she's all, this is how you got to play them. When you come into the interview, they're going to kind of, uh, they're going to try to break your balls and kind of give you a hard time. So she's, she, so she, she's all, pay them no respect. She's all, just fucking be you. She'll be exactly how you would be with your friends. And um, I remember her telling me this. And um, there's some footage somewhere out there uh, uh, of the interview of me when I walked in the interview, I think it might be on Fight Pass. You may be able to find it on UFC Fight Pass. Or, you know, or, or, Jeremy told me I thought he said what happened. He told me uh, it's just something like you say I was crazy at the interview. Like you, I, I, I don't know exactly. But I, I was very impressed. I'm like, why wow, he did that? He tell you, please you continue, sir. Continue. What happened? Yeah. Crazy. I, I, thought, I remember I had like a fucking black and like, like fucking fuchsia colored mohawk. I had like torn up sleeves, cut up sleeves, said like fucking punch people or like yeah. I punch people. And I, I remember I just walk in fucking on my phone, like and I'm not paying attention to them at all. Just like not even fucking. Uh, and the guys, there's a clip of it. It's kind of funny. Um, I think it's on Fight Pass or like, yeah, if you just, or under like uh, Ultimate Fighter Season 5 bloopers or something like that. I think I have the D and it's, it's maybe, maybe it's a, I think it's a, an option on the DVD, but it shows the interview when I walk in and everything. It's crazy, it's crazy, but I killed it. I killed it. She said, she came out laughing. I completely killed the interview. She came out laughing, crying, laughing. She said, oh my God. She's like, that might've been the best entertaining interview we've ever done. And um, I remember I came in on my phones, like threw my feet up, but it was cool. It was, it was in the bag. And um, that was just kind of very like young, immature time in my life too. I, I, I didn't take it as seriously as I should have. And um, anyone that knows that season knows the talent that was on that season. I mean, Nate Diaz. That was one of the hard, that was hard. I, I was going to try out, but I'm glad I did it. Man, that, that was you were on there, Nate Diaz on there, American Bourne on there, uh, the, uh, the Green Man was on there. Yeah, season Man. five, that, that was a sick season. That was a, the tall guy, because uh, Corey Hill was his name. Corey Hill, yeah, yeah. Corey Hill. Too. yeah. yeah that's that's it was solid. God rest his soul as well. Yeah, oh. Corey Hill, Cole, uh, Cole, Cole Miller. Uh, Cole, was Cole Miller on that show too? Yeah, Cole, Cole Miller was on that show. God damn. Lauzon, Joe, Joe Lauzon was on the show as Joe well. Joe Lauzon is good. Oh my god. Yeah, that's that a tough season. Yeah, it's crazy. So that was a lot of fun, man. It was cool. The, and again, for me, it was a time of self discovery. And um, I was super young. I didn't know how to manage, but I still was dumb and partying a lot that life. Like I was partying a lot at that time in my life. The most I've ever partied, which was a mistake because I should have been taking it the most serious I could have been, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, well, we, so we want to show, was there any uh, cool stories you can share with the, with the, with the audience there like, that happened that didn't show on TV, sir? Um, yeah, there's one thing that happened that was kind of crazy. Uh, actually, because they told us in the house, they're like, oh, you can do anything you want. Or what? Yeah, you can do anything you want, but you just you can't leave the house. I want you anything you want, huh? Okay. <laughs> so I remember, uh, I remember, uh, I was just, after you go, fuck, you lose your fucking mind, dude. You lose, mm -hmm. you lose your, after you're in the house, they don't give you a phone. There's no TV. There's no music. There's no magazines or books. So you can't entertain yourself. You're, you're forced to, uh, you're forced to engage with each other. And that's what they do. They take away all your outlets of entertainment. So you're forced to engage. And that way you start building up beefs and you get into it with people where you start drinking and doing dumb shit. So I remember I was just bored. And I remember they're out there all back. It was Nate and a few of the guys sitting around the fire pit in the backyard. And um, I remember I, I, I fucking, I went to the, I went into the, uh, the, the cabinet and I grabbed uh, the Pam's Pam cooking spray, you know, <laughs> and uh, it was a whole full can. I don't even think it was open yet. And I went over there and I, and I, I think I distracted them or something. Or I, I tapped them on the shoulder and they all looked. And then I tossed the Pam cooking spray into the fire pit. And they were all sitting around with their feet up on the fire pit. Ooh. Well, these cans, they're very, very explosive. You know what I mean? It's a can of full fucking. And so I threw it in and holy shit, they all fucking jumped back 
And good thing they did because that thing fucking fucking it blew up so much bigger than I had expected. <laughs> Holy shit. Holy shit. It was like, bro, it was like it looked like a fucking like five to eight foot like fireball. Dude, like, as, as big, as big. Like like a fucking grenade went off. And then and then the can was like bent and like part of this thing was still fucking like spraying out. And so f- fire was coming out of the out of the canister and um everyone's like oh my god what do we do what do we do and because the flame was coming out uh the game room was right there mm-hmm. and the game the game room the backyard was like hawaiian themed so there was a bunch of like straw on the roof and uh, because of that the, this flame caught the roof of the game room on fire oh so, my like, god yeah, wild all the guys that uh, came out from the garage where they were staged they all came out with fire extinguishers were like, oh, you know, cut, cut, cut or whatever. Like they put the fire out. Yeah, it's crazy. And they said, okay. It's crazy. Yeah, they said no more fires. No more fires. You guys can do whatever you want. Yeah, they said you guys can do whatever you want in the house, just no more fires. Oh my and god, it's crazy. Yeah. I'm I'm like, we can do anything. They said anything. I said, okay. So then I picked up, I picked up this uh, this like rock or this like little thing like a garden gnome that was out front of the house and i threw it through the window like a, like just to just to see if, just to see if they said anything and the guy like he's like fuck emerson he's like, okay anything just no breaking windows and no fires and so, <laughs> it was so like dope. yeah, yeah it's just like a bunch of kids that kept us in the house you know we were all in our, in our early 20s and we had no phones no outlets no magazines so no, it I was um, it's hard you go crazy that, you go crazy I, you know, it's just, I, you know, I must be 12. It's, it's rough. It's rough. Yeah, hold on. Let me go outside. I'll have to slide it up. All good. There you are. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, that, the house is rough. They put it, and especially after you guys are losing, man, like now you get to the nerves. It, it, it's rough. Yeah, yeah. The nurse is huge that they built up the nurse before by, by taking away our, uh, uh, our entertainment, like the books, the, the phones and all that stuff. So but it's going to create you, your season. No iPhone. There's no internet on your phone. It's just, it's really like just texting. That's it. It's just calling text. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, in your season, they allowed you guys that? No, no. My season, we with no phone, with no phones, no internet. Yeah. We can't do anything. Yeah. yeah. It's the yeah, same, same thing. Same thing. Yeah. 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 Um. Man, what, what was it? Oh. What season? Yeah, what season? Ever, what was that? What season were you on? Twelve. Twelve. I was 12, 12, 12, 12. Okay. Damn. And yeah. they're on. They're on like what? Season thirty now? It sounds like something crazy. Yeah. Wow. Wow. We're coming, coming a long way, man. That's dope. Yeah. Robert. Um. Do we ever have a Timo Yama, sir? Um. Yeah. Yeah. I was. I was on. I was on Team Oyama for I think like seven or eight years. Okay. Uh. Uh-huh. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's a legendary Muay Thai instructor. Um. Was he able to teach you anything or improve your technique or anything you uh took away from being on Team Oyama or Kuri, since Sensei Kuri Yama? Legend. Legend. Yeah. Legend. Legend. Oh, for sure. There. I mean, we had. We had. We had. We had a. We had a tough squad back then. Um. Yeah, uh, Rampage was on our team. You know, Tito was on our team. We had a bunch of tough up and comers. A lot of good Muay Thai fighters on our team. Romeo Danza. Um, Romeo Danza, uh, yeah, he's dope. Muay Muay champion, yeah. Yeah, uh, Joe Schilling would come down and spar with the guys. Like it was a very, it was cool. Like uh, it was cool because the the Muay Thai community was also very small in Southern California. So we got a lot of good training partners with a lot of lot of different guys. You know, and um, man, freaking. Yeah, Timo Yama was, was a very good stand-up style and a made team in Southern California at that time. And it was cool. And um, a lot of the guys are still doing good. Yeah, Ian McCall came mm-hmm. through there. And, you know, Shane Del Rosario also became a, a Muay Thai champion there. And, man, um, uh, it's crazy. A lot of guys. It was like a staple. The Timo Yama is another staple gym um, in the in – the, in the in the in the storyline of MMA, especially in Southern California, you know what I mean, and um, yeah, so and I, they're still doing good. He's still up and running. He's still got fighters coming out of there, so it's cool to see. 
I, I have two questions for you. Uh, so I didn't know that Joe Schilling, uh, uh trains you. He's a scary dude. Do you ever spot sure. with him? I would never spot with him, but do you ever? Uh, do I you don't think crazy? I don't, I, yeah, I don't think I didn't around with Joe. I think the weight division and all that was too yeah. big, especially yeah. that for that age. Okay. Um, but I think he did around with my friend Shane, you know, Del Rosario and everything that passed. So uh, the bigger guys, I think he would come out for Shane specifically. Oh. And we had King Guantanamo Bay was there. Yeah, I was gonna ask it was you. Like a fam- yeah, King Guantanamo. King was not he. You know, um, I know this. My my, my wife's Japanese lady. When I went over, to, I go to Japan often. Tango, he's famous. He's like a rugby. He's like a famous rugby player over there. He's, he's a celebrity. Yeah, I know yeah, that. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, he's a big. He's a big deal. I'm calling. Yeah. Him, he's calling. Him. There's a lot of Japanese guys from Japan at your place. Yeah, Robert. Yeah. Um. Yeah, he would always, yeah, he would, they would always, at uh, Fujita, Fujita would come down and oh, train. Oh, really? Park. The, 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 yeah. the giant, yeah. The, 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 remember, remember when Vander kept kicking him in the head? Boom, boom, yeah, boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of, I, I've been obsessed with, like, the Japanese culture since I was a kid. Um, I, I, I've had the privilege uh, to go over there four different times. I fought in the Osaka, Tokyo, uh, Yokohama. Oh, so. That's right, that's right. Oh, wow, dope. Yeah. Yeah, it's been oh. cool. I love Japan. They're very cool because they got Pancrase, they got Shudo, they got a bunch of. Uh, have you fought? Have you fought for, the, for have you fought in Japan for, for Robert? Yeah, yeah, I fought in deep. I remember I fought. Yeah, I fought deep. Fought for, fought for a title fight in deep, which Dope. was like the sister company of. It was a sister company of Pride at the time. Um, and then, yeah, then I also fought Pancrase. The original. Yep. That's so the, that's the original. Oh yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Depends on what is that. Um. Yeah, now, now, real quick. Um. Uh. Um. How were you able to do you you now to the MA lab right with Ben Henderson and as there? How were you uh, able to get over there, sir? Say it again. How were you able to start training in the uh, the MA lab, sir? You know, uh, Oh, like how how is training going? Oh, how, how, how did you over there? Oh, I just oh I just they were. It was I was just looking to get out of California and go. I was looking at either uh, Arizona the lab or uh, Colorado for for Dwayne's gym, and then um, or uh, or Vegas. And at the time, Vegas had a lot of the gyms shut down, mm. closed down, and then so the next closest thing was Arizona the MMA lab, and so. I'm like, all right, I'll go out there and check it out. And uh, at first, I was over at at Fight Ready, um, which is another gym that 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 that's out here, um, kind of like the rivalist gym uh, uh, of ours. Um, they're down in Scottsdale. Um, and I was there for a while, I think for like a week or two weeks. Um, but it was just a different vibe. There's a lot less guys I had to train with. I remember the first day I showed up there, I like put on hand wraps and I started like shadow boxing with one of the guys and. He starts picking it up a little bit. So I start picking it up a little bit and he starts picking up a little bit. So I start picking up a little bit. And before you know, it, we're in a full on fist fight with just our wraps on. Yeah, that's dangerous. Man. It, yeah. It's my first day there. I'm trying to warm up, like to see what's up to maybe join the team. And so that was just kind of a weird vibe. And um, actually, John Crouch, I guess, uh, heard that I was in the area and that I was looking to join a new team. And uh, he had reached out to me on a, on a couple different occasions. And I just thought that was very cool and, and humble of him. I've never had a, cow, a coach actually reach out to me. And um, so he had me come down and, and check out the gym. And uh, it was, it was, it was cool, man. It was like, it was like love at first sight. I was, it was like, oh, okay, this is, this is my new home. And um, man, it's, it's been my favorite gym, favorite team I've ever been a part of. It's, it's really, really awesome what they have going on there. They do a Lab, really good you're talking, about, you're talking about the MLM, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do a really good job of making it like a, a, a pro fight gym, like an elite level fighters gym, but also like a family oriented, like, you know, fun place for families and moms and dads and kids. Like, that's, that's, so it's really point. cool. Yeah. Yeah. John Crouch is doing an amazing job with the place. So it's awesome. John, is he the, the owner or one of the trainers there, sir? Uh, yeah. He, yeah. He's part, him and Ben are part owners along with some other guys. And, uh, and then, and then, uh, yeah, he's also the head coach. And then, uh, and then uh, I'm the head striking coach and Benson's like the team captain kind of does everything as well. And then, yeah, then we kind of got just a lot of guys, all hands on deck. we got a lot of fighters coming in and out and 
we have uh, a lot of the guys that hold pads for each other and train for each other. You know, uh, David Mashad from, from the PFL, the Bulldog, he's over there helping out and everything. And uh, uh, Randy's over there too. So it's, uh, it's cool. We got a lot of guys. Um, like I said, it's all hands on deck. So to run a university, uh, you're going to need a few different professors. You know what I mean? You can't just have one teacher, one professor in a university. You're going to have a lot of minds, a lot of hands on deck, especially when we've got different fighters that leave and come and go and everything. You know what I mean? So also my boy Eddie's over there helping out now too. So it's He's cool. Telling, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. So, uh, Eddie Shaw left. He is over at, uh, he's at fight ready now. So yeah, he works primarily with, um, yeah, um, Korean zombie and those guys oh, and a lot of the other yeah. fighters. There. So you said Randy, you mean Randy Couture? Oh, no, 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 no. Randy Stanky. He's a, he's one of the guys on the team and Eddie Rincon. He's on our team. But yeah. Uh, uh, he's on a, just just guys that were on the lab, like we're all fighters, but now we're kind of transitioning to coaches, and so we're kind of all helping out, taking care of the gym, and so yeah, it's uh, it's cool to see the different guys step up and help out because we have a lot of talent there. We have a lot of guys, a lot of good guys, guys in LFA, guys in Bellator, guys in PFL, guys in the UFC. So we're very very busy. You know what I mean, Robert? Um, I does Alex? I think you trained with one of my old. Um, uh, alumni from Tough Twelve, Alex Caceres, right? Is he came to Alex? Oh, Alex yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, he was there for a long time. I believe now he's out in Florida. Oh, he I think left. He opened up, yeah, he left. He left about a year ago, and I think now he's out in Florida. He opened up his own gym out there. Oh, congrats to him! Yeah. Oh, I know. I, I was in a fight with him. You know, um, at the time of the show, we didn't get along too well. You know, we get button heads. But as the show, he's that a real nice guy, real humble, real, real sweet guy. Um. How was your how was your experience with a cool guy? He's cool. Um, he's cool. I mean, I liked him. He was harmless, uh, but he did have the personality that it clashed with a lot of guys. You know, yeah. Um, yeah he's kind of he's pretty eccentric. You know, you know Alex. <laughs> you know Alex. And um, yeah, I, I yeah, but, yeah. Sparring wise, he would kind of. I don't know. I remember I had one incident with him where he kind of took sparring kind of personal or whatever. Which whatever. Like I, I don't. I don't know. I, I thought it was kind of, I don't know. I was, yeah, we're all professionals in there. You know what I mean? You shouldn't take anything personal, especially if like, if I'm freaking orthodox and I'm going to switch and go Southpaw for you to give you a good look, then, you know, don't get mad if I have to, you know, like keep up to like defend myself. You know what I mean? Uh, it, but, it, it's just practice, man. Yeah, for sure. But um, no, he was good, good, good style for the guys. I thought he was a good, give the guy a good look, give the guys a good look. And um, I think he's doing good. For, I think he went out to try to join American top team. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if he's still there or not, but I heard he also opened, his, opened up his own gym. So, yeah. Uh, okay, that's the handle. Okay. Last question, Robert. I, mean, I really appreciate this time. I'm, I'm giving you a lot of good information. It's cool stuff, man. You, you, live, a lot, you live a life. It's crazy. You're a good, uh, good life there. Thank um, you, sir. La last question is my deal. And we have a fan question. Fan questions. I'm um, sorry, last question. Um, what is it like to the, the former music champion, Ben Henderson, sir? It's, it's awesome. It's, uh, it's the mindset, the, the minds, the minds that we have there under the roof of the MMA lab. It's, uh, it's something special. It's a collective of decades of martial arts experience from champions to journeymen to, to, to coaches. Um, it's really, really cool. It's a, it's like, um, I tell everyone, it's like, we're, we're like an MIT or like a Stanford of MMA. You know, there's, there's a lot of MMA gyms. There's, there's thousands of MMA gyms all over the world, but there's very few. I mean, like the top 10, I believe the MMA lab is, is one of the top 10 gyms. And um, it's because of the, it's because of the, um, it's because of the, the formula we have there. We have a very good formula with a lot of good, uh, got a lot of good talent and we have a very low injury rate. You know, we got very controlled that's rounds. That's important. that's important. That's important. Yeah, it's the most important. It's the most important. And to keep the injury rate low and also have your guys win and perform. So a lot of our fighters, they all get performance bonuses, knockout bonuses, finishes bonuses. Um, on all the local shows, whenever we do the local shows, we usually have all of our guys win. The last one we had a couple of weeks ago, we had all five guys win. We got another Ooh. set of five guys. We got five more guys fighting on Sunday in two days. And um, we're gonna clean the house then too. So it's awesome. It's, it's awesome to be a part of something that uh, that's super special. And like I said, it's one of my favorite things I've ever been a part of. Uh, dope. 
All right, Robert, do you know what time it is? Time is Bad questions, yeah, bad questions. <laughs> right on, right on, let's bad, do it. Bad questions. Oh, all right, all right. You see, I'm by uh, TTR125. Uh, is it true about fighters pay? Everything that we watch in MMA, all I hear about is fighters complaining about fighters pay. What's your opinion on that, sir? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, fighters are not getting paid definitely what, what they deserve. And it is a hustle um, up until you guys make it or break it. Even guys that make it in the UFC, you know what I mean? Depending on your contract, um, depending on taxes and paying fight camp and all that stuff, these guys don't make that, that, that much money um, uh, unless you get up there to the pay-per-view buys. That's when you start making, you know, life-changing money. Um with that being said, I think they they could they could pay the fighters a little bit more, especially I think with the introduction of the Reebok, which is now the Venom. I think that whole sponsorship deal kind of fucked up things for a lot of fighters okay. as far as money on the side. You know, hundred percent definitely messed it up, messed it up. Yeah, a lot of the guys had a hustle, and that that the having the sponsors for the fight that was a side hustle. It was, that it was paid for that paid for camp, that paid for the bills to get you through the next fight camp and yep, stuff. So. Yep. Uh, yeah, I kind mean, of fuck so, people. So I mean, more money out of sponsors in the fight. For sure, a lot of guys have. Yeah, man, for sure. I remember, I made, I made, I made over twenty seven, twenty seven thousand dollars in one of my UFC fights just sure. from sponsors. Just from sponsors. That's a lot of money. A lot of money. That, that, that would never happen now with Ben Emmer, and that, that's how I was a top ranked guy. You know what I mean? So, it's, it's, it's awful. It's awful. It's not, not yeah. good. It's not good. For for sure. All uh, right. Next question, sir. So, by our um, CMB Forever Seven, why did you leave Team Oyama? Um, I think I just wanted something, some growth. I feel, I feel like I hit a plateau, and I wanted growth. I wanted something different. And um, uh, from there, uh, Coach Jason Perello kind of caught my attention. I, I was following BJ. I was a big fan of BJ. And then um, I met BJ on the Ultimate Fighter show. And I think meeting BJ and all those guys, um, I kind of wanted to, after training at the Ultimate Fighter and training other new coaches, I, I think I, it opened up my mind and my horizon. And I wanted to just go explore and get some new kind of training and go out there. So I remember I went to Hawaii to go visit BJ and go out there and help him train for a camp and everything. And I just remember when I came back, um, I tried, I came back and, uh, at the time Colin, they have moved, they moved out of their main location. They moved into a smaller location right down the street. And, um, I kind of got weirdest vibes from Colin sometimes, to be honest, like kind of like unwelcome vibes or kind of just like, I don't know. He kind of sometimes, sometimes he gives off like a negative or kind of like a, kind of a rough kind of energy. I remember I went down there after visiting Hawaii and I went, Hey, what's up coach. I tried to say hi to him and, and, uh, greet him. And he was, the class was warming up at the time. And, um, well, he didn't even look at me. No, I kind of, no, no. Hey, how's it going like this? Kind of just, Hey, what? And shook his side and just kept looking like, I'm like, bro, what's you going to acknowledge me, dude. Like he didn't even fucking acknowledge me. And that to me was like the straw on the camel's back. I'm like, dude, this guy doesn't even fucking like want to acknowledge that I'm here. Like, that's kind of disrespectful. Like, I was kind of excited. I came in just to see him and to pay my respects and to let him know, hey, I'm back in town. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah, so whatever. I kind of just was like, all right, fine. I, I kind of I, I feel like unwelcome here. I'll just go somewhere else. And from there, it was cool because I started training with Jason Puello over at Ruka. And, and I, my, I spent another seven years or so with Jason there and also going uh, into Kings of MMA as well. So I was at Ruka and Kings um, for the last stint of my uh, California training before I came out here to Arizona. How many years were you at Kings uh, before you left? I think like seven years or so off and on. Okay. I remember when uh, Bill Cordero came from Brazil when he was first over at uh, – the, the Affliction Warehouse in Long Beach. Uh, Inside the Affliction Warehouse, there's these two huge, like, 10-foot, like, medieval doors. And you open them up this way, and the inside was, like, a cage inside the warehouse with some mats and everything. And it was really cool, actually. Um, and that was Seal, Seal Beach, right? Seal Beach? Yeah, Seal Beach. Yep, Seal yeah, Beach. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, yeah, Affliction sponsored me and my friends at the time and all that stuff. So it was cool. Uh, and Southern California was a cool-ass place for MMA. Yeah. Oh yeah! Oh man! 
All right, la- la- last minute by Chuck Taylor. Have you ever thought about fighting in Japan in forms of the Ryzen, Tyrus, or Shuto? Oh, I would love to. Man, I would love to. I remember it was a couple of years back. I uh, I got offered to fight on the S Cup, which I do every two years. And S Cup is shoot box style fighting. So you were the oh, eight ounce. Yes, right. The shoot box. Yeah. This is like, yeah. like, he's like yeah, shoot boxing and take down something like that, right? Yeah, so you can choke them out. You can choke them out on the feet and guillotines and you can take them down but then after that you stand back up mm. and the rest of it's all kickboxing so we they bond, do like bond, a bond goes, right we bond goes. yeah 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 and it, it was going to be a uh i think it's an eight-man tournament i was going to do um yeah it's crazy the, the first fight i was pitted against was morab uh, uh morab amrani which is uh he was the he was the the light the glory lightweight kickboxing champion oh, at the time sc- scary oh, like, killer. <laughs> I had some passport issues happen like three days. I flew out on Monday and I realized I didn't realize my passport was expired until that Friday. And so dude, the place was closed by the time I got up to LA. Oh man, I couldn't even get it expedited. It was a, it was a, I trained the whole camp for that and everything. And then right before I left, man, so bummed about that. Crazy. I would have, I would have loved to fight and compete under that rule setting, but, um, yeah, I've also never fought out here in Arizona, and I'm talking to some promoters right now of a show called Rough MMA. Uh, we actually got five guys fighting there on Sunday, um, but they're going to try to look for an opponent for me to fight out here to do a main event show um, in, probably in September. So I'll be getting ready for that. Do probably do like a featherweight fight out here, maybe fight for a title or something like that would be cool. Yeah, wow. How much you, how much you weigh, sir, right now, oh, on average, walking around that? Uh, right now, I'm like, I think I'm like 173. Well, you be you be dude. You want to featherweight because I yeah. can't fight. I've been, I went sixty. You know, you want to stay? You be dude, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I mess around with the alkaline diet a lot, and I find that like cutting weight has actually gotten a lot easier now that I'm, now that I'm more mindful about my diet and what I put in my body and how I treat how how I live. You know, my lifestyle basically, and I'm um, just crazy. The most I've ever cut was I think I did forty three pounds in five days. Yeah, five, five from, days. Yeah, I went from one seventy three, I think it was one seventy three down to one thirty six. Oh, you got thirties. Yeah, oh. well, well, yeah, one thirty. But I started my oh. cut at one seventy three, down to yeah. Well, that, well, my, who'd you who'd you fight? Um, it? Oh, it's crazy. It's honestly my best performance I've ever had. Wow! Uh, it was again my first fight in ACB. Now the promotion is called ACA. But uh, it was called ACB. Really, uh, really and, like Russia, right? Uh, Russia. Yeah. Was, the promotion is from Russia, but this fight was in Nottingham, England, oh. and uh, I, I beat one of their like one of their up and comers. They actually just recently took the fight off of YouTube. Oh, I'm so pissed about it. I have some of the fight recorded, some of the video recording on my phone, but man, they took the fight down off YouTube. I'm super pissed because that's the only fight footage I have of that fight, and it's my best performance ever. Mm-hmm. actually mm-hmm. when i got out there just just so happens my um the guy i was fighting was like the protege of the promotion they were kind of pushing him mm-hmm. if he were to beat me he would have been i think 11 and 1 and would have went to the ufc and mm-hmm. um my gear bag with all my weight cutting stuff my plastics i had a sauna come out everything they, they lost it at the airport oh, every, wow. every, every oh. other bag showed everyone's bag showed up except my bag even my normal bag, even my normal bag, my clothes was there, but not my weight cut bag. Perfect. So Perfect. I, I, I had to do that last, that last leg of that weight cut with just old school. I, I get a fuck. I took a trash bag because there was no plastics. High school right there. Trash bag, high school. Trash bag, cut a hole. Boom. And I got on the treadmill and I just ran my ass off. My coach, Jacob Harmon at the time was like, no, 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 we're not going to make it. He's all stressing. He didn't think we we're going to do it. I just got in my mind. I'm like, no, I'm going to make the weight. I've never once not made weight. I made weight yeah. every single time. And I was going to say, no, I'm going to make this weight. So that weight cut was the gnarliest one I've ever done. I went from 173 down to 136 yeah. within five weeks. And the last part was with a trash bag and a treadmill, just old school. And then and, real old school. And so I not only made the weight, but I went out there and had the best performance I've ever had. Wow. You know what I mean? Pretty cool. I think I was 37. I think I was 37 years old at the time. Mm. You know what I mean? Oh, 37 was only a few. It's just, it's just recent. It's recent. 
you know, yeah, this is like years yeah. ago. Yeah, this is like two and a half. Years. I think you're, I think you're a year older. Than me. I'm thirty eight. Are you thirty nine right now? Well, I'm forty. July thirtieth. Oh, you're, you're 30, oh, yeah. oh, you oh, next month. Oh, okay, happy birthday, sir. Happy birthday. Yeah, oh man. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Robert, oh, Robert. Um, you know, uh, around this time, you know, man, thank you so much for the interview, sir. I cannot wait to post this. Um, so here's the thing. I want to say, in life, you have two options. You we together will say, I heard that. You ready, sir? Hey guys, thank yep. you very much for watching this episode of the Five Hundred Content, guys. Uh, Five Hundred Podcast. You guys, uh, thank you very much, Robert Emerson, the legend, for coming on the show. Guys, in life, we have two options. Robert, fight or die. Or die. die. Well, you know, I can't wait. Oh, my, 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 I'm gonna text you when I post this, right, brother? Yeah, oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye, bye. See you later. Hey. Bye. Have a good one. Yeah.